Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. Welcome back, everybody. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. This is Silicon Angles The Cube. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. James Noga is here, he's the CIO of Partners Healthcare, based here in Massachusetts. James, Jim, thanks Jim, for coming yeah. on The Cube. Appreciate that. <laughs> so, first of all, welcome. Um, second of all, you have a, um, well, let's talk about, talk about your role first. Partners is a very well-known organization here, but our right. audience you know, outside of Massachusetts may not be as familiar, so. Yeah, so uh, our partners, its founding members are uh, the Mass General Hospital and Brigham Women's Hospital, which uh, combined in terms of NIH funding uh, have the, the most NIH funding in the, in the country. Uh, it's over a, uh, about a $1.5 billion in research funding. So in this particular conference and things like Big data. Big data is extremely important to healthcare as we talk about improving patient safety, uh, really cutting cost, uh, but important to our academic medical centers is discovery. Just massive amounts of data with genetics and genomics, uh, with the digitizing of images, is a lot of uh, very new opportunities for uh, discovery, both asking questions and sort of finding answers that we weren't looking for things like pharmacovigilance, so it's exciting. Well, this is a, Jeff and I, uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to our hearts. As you were saying off camera, his wife's a nurse. I, I've followed big data for a while now, and um, you know, Jeff Hammerbacher of, of Facebook and Cloud Air are very famous for saying, the best minds of my generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads. That's what big data has, has, has right. become. And he left Cloud Air, I guess he's still involved, but he's now at Mount Sinai Medical and doing some great work down there. So. Yeah, that statement was sort of tongue-in-cheek, uh, and, and it's becoming not true, right? I mean, right. <laughs> the best minds are actually sol solving some of the world's most difficult problems uh, in, in a variety of industries. So I wonder if you could talk about big data in healthcare. You're, you've got a, a session tomorrow sure. on that topic. You know, where are we at with big data in healthcare? A uh, couple places. One is uh, you know, we have massive amounts of what I would call administrative and claims data uh, that you know, we, we can start to model in terms of what our costs really are and really taking on uh, the, the task of bending total medical expenses and lowering them because, you know, it's really unsustainable, the, uh, the current growth rate of medical expenses. So, you know, and that's, that's blocking and tackling, but just being able to go through massive amounts of data and do that analysis. More importantly, I think, is looking for patterns in clinical data in terms of outcomes that drive evidence-based medicine and clinical decision support. Because what we have found over the years is people talk about clinical decision support and they may embed thousands of rules. And some of these rules can be uh, irritating to physicians, like why am I getting this alert? The fact is, I think now that we have big data, we can go back and look at the efficacy of those rules. Because we actually think probably 60 to 65% are unnecessary and don't really result in a different treatment mm -hmm. protocol or a better outcome. To get in the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So that evidence-based medicine. And then things such as uh, pharmacovigilance. I don't know if you remember uh, the, the Viax, what happened with Viox. Oh, I was on Viox at the time. Okay. Yeah, for my <laughs> he <back>. remembers. <laughs> yeah, I so, do remember. So great, we're, we're fairly certain with big data analysis that that pattern could have been picked up and predicted well in advance uh, that being reported and sort of there being an, an intervention. Because it ends up in clinical trials, while they're extensive, they're still fairly narrow in terms of their patient population. Mm. It's really once a drug is out in the field, is being able to not just, let's say, partners that has three and a half million active patients, but being able to look at you know outcomes across multiple medical centers and being able to quickly assess, you know, could something be happening? So the whole idea of uh, pharmacovigilance. And then in terms of treatment, you know, in genetics and genomics, you know, what, what we're finding is with different variants, and you know, this is especially uh, related to uh, can the treatment of cancer, 
is particular cocktails may work extremely well for you, but through genetics we may find out that it's actually harmful for you. So it's really being able to do that mass customization of treatment protocols, whether it be for cancer or, or other d disease states. And that's what really uh, big data is uh, starting to, to offer us. And then being able to look at uh, digitized images and do an analysis on a massive basis. So one of uh, the people on the panel tomorrow, uh, Dr. Sean Murphy, he talks about the fact that now with digitized images, they actually think, you know, diagnosing a, a schizophrenia in adulthood, that actually going back to childhood and being able to go through images quickly, because kids get concussions, they have MRIs, that they can look for, are there patterns in childhood that can be predictive mm -hmm. of schizophrenia in adulthood through you know, image analysis. Some amazing examples there. I mean, if, if the, the, the first one you're talking about, uh, you know, the Vioxx example, I mean, the trials are samples, and, right. and sampling just doesn't give you the efficacy of right. you know, the, the data in the field. And you talked about, you know, basically the cocktail, that's, it used to be brute force hit and hope yes. to, to, to see what worked. My question is, there's a big theme in the big data world about real time. Is, is real time seeping into your world yet? Uh, not yet. It is. Do you see it happening? Or? I, I, think, uh, I think it will happen, uh, but, it, but it, it isn't quite there. It more is in that retrospective evidence-based analysis, uh -huh. which is why you're seeing big data, I think, uh, first take a foothold in the research community in that area of, of discovery. But, but uh, you know, I think it can. And, you know, we've talked about also how does social media play into the health record in terms of big data. Can you look for patterns and, and postings in that are, that are indicative of possibly a person slipping into depression? But, you know, it ends up that uh, depression has this effect that when people become depressed, they, you know, they stop taking their meds, not their depression meds, but all, you know, that it really impacts healthcare and being able to detect that quickly is uh, extremely important. And so, how, how, technically, how are you how are you attacking this problem? Is it is it massive Hadoop clusters? Is it a combination of EDWs and so traditional it's, uh, technologies? Well, one thing we know, it's not a monolithic yes, database. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. Not of, a god box. No, <laughs> a lot of distributed data, a lot of metadata, and, and we we have the traditional. EDW, mm -hmm. though we're actually even doing that with what I would call a federated model with metadata and creating data marts. But on the research end, in fact, we, we are bringing in like the Duke clusters and starting to really work with those and say, how can we leverage those in terms of uh, big data in healthcare? <laughs> and big data, uh, you know, not to, not to slight it, but you know, it's just more data, mm -hmm. you know, just <laughs> massive amounts of data. Is, is really big data, and some of it is structured, but in healthcare, the majority of data is actually unstructured, so the, the dictated notes of a physician. Mm. Now we use things like you know NLP and that to try to do analysis of those notes and put it into some type of, some type of structure. And, and same thing on images, although images now, they're starting to develop what I would call header information along with the images that's giving it some structure. So, yeah, and, and you know, big, you're right, big data, it's, it's more data, but it's also a, a new techniques of, of handling yes. it. And as we talked about before, it's not taking little samples. And, and we're seeing the, the outcomes all throughout healthcare. We swipe a credit card, we get a phone, somebody tries to, 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 to rip us off or you know, right. steal our credit card, you get a phone call virtually immediately. Those things weren't possible five or seven years ago. That's correct. And, and the other thing where it becomes really important, I talked about, uh, genetics, so you know, just the massive amount of data. As there's new knowledge, being able to quickly go back and apply that new knowledge to data mm -hmm. that you already have. Mm. So, you know, and we think uh, you know, that's actually going to probably raise some ethical questions and some privacy questions in terms of what, what do I do when you, know, you had a genetic test for me five years ago, today I discover something and I have to call you up and say, you know, you have a you have a really bad disease, uh, and, and what is our responsibility to do that? To right. go back through mm -hmm. that massive amounts of, of data and do that type of analysis 
as there's new discoveries and new knowledge. But the, and the epiphany there is there's real value in that historical. They used to be, oh, the data's old, it's not valuable, and we'll keep it just because, but stick it in an iron mountain somewhere, and Correct. hopefully we'll never have to go get it. Yeah. Now it's it's a valuable source of information. Yes, and, and petabytes, you know, every month <laughs> it's uh, big. that we're generating, <laughs> yes. So you've got some, you've got ethical considerations, um, but talk a little bit about the challenges of working with data, large-scale data analytics in an environment, healthcare, that's you know, highly regulated and somewhat right. un uncertain. I mean, we just saw yesterday two different courts uh, come to different conclusions about one aspect of, of the Affordable Care Act, whether it was valid or not. Correct. So you've got, a, a, it, the, the sand is shifting beneath your feet pretty much all the time. How does that make your job in terms of managing and making better use of data more difficult? Well, I, I think uh, what it really points out is having agility, which as you said, no, no God boxes, right. um, and the, the ability to apply, whether it's uh, Hadoop or other uh, BI techniques to data, and the fact that, yes in yes. fact, on a, and I don't think it's isolated to healthcare, but knowledge changes over time, mm -hmm. and applying that, that new knowledge to that data is what we need to be able to do fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I've fully answered your question. Well, no, I think so. I mean, it's, it strikes me that when you've got a uh, you know, regulatory environment that's changing so rapidly, um, yeah. that as a, as a healthcare organization, as any organization in an environment like that, right. you've got to be flexible for sure. Yeah, so uh, let, let me follow up. Sure. Uh, so you're right on the regulatory means in terms of uh, there's fairly extensive consenting process. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to obtain consent from patients to use their data in research. Um, and so it, it's really, from a culturally, is being able to communicate to patients the value of that research while maintaining the, their privacy. So mm -hmm. in, in healthcare- Get uh, it to opt in, essentially. Uh, yes, you yeah. do have to opt in, <laughs> and, uh, and we're actually doing that and now. Giving an incentive to do that, right? I mean, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And the incentive is improving healthcare, still respecting the privacy of, of the individual. So, you know, if you've ever heard the word HIPAA, there's, yeah. there's a lot of regulations <laughs> in terms of security and privacy. Yep. In the research community, there's a whole institutional review board that uh, you, know, you can look at cohorts of patients anonymously but once you're actually going to start the research, you have to work through the physicians, contact the patients, and uh, mm -hmm. obtain that, that consent. It's a little bit laborious, but I, I do think it's necessary mm -hmm. in terms of uh, respecting the privacy mm -hmm. of individuals. And you know, you not only have to get the patients to opt in in a situation like that, but in terms of getting uh, your clinicians, your doctors, nurses, to actually start using, or, or start using more data-driven approaches to making decisions, whether it's developing treatments or, or diagnosing patients yes. or you know day-to-day -day care of patients. Talk about that. How do, how do you actually go about that change management component? And you know, d doctors are notoriously you know, a little bit fickle about how they operate and, and you know, sometimes think that they know better than the data might be telling them. Perhaps maybe that's changing, maybe that's not a fair assessment, but how do you go about actually getting, in your case, clinicians to actually adopt some of these new approaches? Yeah, so, so we've had uh, good adoption with our electronic health where uh, electronic health record and clinical decision support, but we've been doing it for, for some time. And I think it's uh, when they start to see the value when, when you can produ produce statistics of uh, how many drug-drug interactions didn't occur because there was clinical decision support. And we can track that and say, this order was going to be placed and we, you know, we prevented an adverse event. Well, that, that becomes meaningful to clinicians, as well as you know, the clinician is no longer uh, you know, sort of the, the single person. It's really team care, and I, mm. and I think they realize that some of that has to happen asynchronously, and that's where technology and decision support can aid in sort of that asynchronous treatment of a patient. It's just not, you know, the, the single physician. In a sense, they're the quarterback, but they mm -hmm. have a whole team behind them of nurse practitioners, <laughs> physician assistants, um, the allied health professions, pharmacist, all, they, all those come into play. So Jim, I wanted to ask you, uh, the big theme of this conference is the chief data officer, the, the, the emergence of, of that role, certainly big in, in regulated industries like financial services and healthcare and, and government. What are you seeing within your industry as far as the CDO? What does that mean for the, the role of the CIO and how is that emerging? 
So I, I, th I think uh, in healthcare, what I am starting to see is an affinity for people saying we need chief data scientists, and they're different than you know your typical what I would call business analyst mm -hmm. or people that you know do uh, research against a EDW. So so there's recognition of that. In fact, we've talked about the concept. Uh, in medical research, we have things that are called core labs that people can reference. That you have a group of chief data scientists that really are the experts and understand the data that can help people sort of when they want to do their big data analysis. Because you know, it's that old figures lie liars figure of, all right, let's get the question right and let's get the right data set to get the appropriate answer so that I don't have conflicting conclusions coming out of the, the same data set. Now, those chief data scientists, do they report to a Chief Data Officer, don't don't know yet. I would say uh, we're not there yet in terms of a uh, Chief Data Officer. We are there in terms of enterprise governance and uh, sort of that concept of having a core lab. I think it will evolve into a Chief Data Officer. And you asked about the, the CIO, and I, I say this maybe because I'm near retirement. And I guess, uh, <laughs> is um, yeah. I think in 10 years, the role of the CIO may be dramatically different. In fact, there may not be CIOs. I really see what I do on a daily basis is, um, yeah, a CIO has to maintain the infrastructure. A lot of things are moving to the cloud. A lot of the things with converged technology, uh, there's, there's less in terms of, of sort of managing that complexity. And it's becoming a utility. So, in the 1800s, right, every manufacturing plant had its own power plant. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, we're still building data centers, but yeah. I think you're gonna see less of that. And I think the CIO, those that are gonna be successful need to focus on sort of what I would call the optimizations of workflow processes. You know, whether that's Lean, Six Sigma, uh, I mean, there, there's many programs, but I think the focus is going to be optimizing the business. And that the CIO, I think typically you, heard CIO say, well, we're an enabling, we're, we're an enabler of the strategy. And I think the CIO needs to play a role in terms of the formation of the strategy. In a sense, they're almost morphing into chief operating officers. So I, I could see the day when a COO is fairly competent in information technology as well as business operations mm -hmm. and has like a chief data officer, a CTO reporting to them. Uh, but there really isn't the concept of the, the CIO anymore. It's more uh, a convergence of the COO and the CIO role. So just, just the theory. Yeah, so it sounds like more focused on business process optimization versus IT maintenance, keeping things up and running. Correct, yeah. That's interesting. You know, when I was a kid, you know, I got out the timing light on the car and cha you know, checked the points. <laughs> yeah, right. You don't do any of that, right? <laughs> exactly, you drive the car. <laughs> well, you don't go under the hood anymore. It's, well, uh, unless well, you really know what you're doing. So you have the equipment, right? It's probably a good analogy. The CIO is coming out from under the hood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's, well, it's interesting coming from a CIO that you, ha you have that, that view. So, if follow-up question would be, and we, we've been asking a lot of folks here, is, this, is the CDO role a flash in the pan? You're saying no. We, we've been asking people, will the CDO role be here in 10 years? And you're saying absolutely. I think it will be. I think uh, because not just big data, but analytics, I think really is a competitive advantage. And a company that doesn't invest in it um, may not be here in, in 10 years. That, that's really what it's, I think analytics is really the next next frontier in competitiveness. And you know, you made some references, Google, everybody, in terms of getting people to click on advertising. You know, that, that's what it's all about. Well, you remember not, the... Not in healthcare. But you but remember the, the early 2000s and Nick Card, does IT matter? Um, clearly, IT matters. IT matters. <laughs> um, but IT is so now embedded in the operations. And you know, what I find, at least in healthcare, you know, I, I run into physicians uh, in particular aspects of IT. Hey, they know it as well as I do. Mm -hmm. so, so there isn't a knowledge advantage anymore, I think, in the role of the CIO, which is why it needs to evolve into what I would call the business operations and that optimization aspect. Well, we were at the ServiceNow um, Knowledge Conference earlier this year in May, and Frank Slootman stood up and he said the CIO role, essentially, he said it differently than what you just said. He didn't say the CIO role is going away because all his customers would have stabbed him. But he essentially said that the role of the CIO must morph into one of a business person, yes. which is exactly what you're saying. Right. It's a, it's, a, it's a COO role, it's a business role, and you're going to have a CTO, 
yeah. that worries about you know, all the architecture and keeping the lights on. And exactly. Making sure that it's all working properly. And, and that's not going to be his or her role to be a, a, a data czar, right? That's right. a different emerging incremental role. And I think CIOs, rather than see this as threatening, should see it as exciting. Yeah, because they can get a promotion, a COO. That's a well, new no, And you're sitting <laughs> with senior leadership. You're no longer at the end of the line. Uh, as decisions are made, you become part of that formation of the strategy rather than the receiver of the strategy in that oh no moment of how am I going to do this. Well, but that's a, that's a, you're talking, we're talking growth path for CIOs as well. A lot of CIOs aren't deep techies, especially in large organizations, but in smaller companies, the CIO oftentimes is a, comes out of the, a technical role. So you, there's your path. You go be C, CTO or a, or a business operations role. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so if you're an existing CIO, how do you start, who maybe doesn't have a seat at the table right now, how do you start to kind of wedge your way into that, into that role and take more of a business side role uh, versus just the, the infrastructure role? I think you have to actively engage senior leadership. You may even have to uh, push a few doors open rather than waiting for them to be opened. Um, you know, <laughs> my senior leadership has been very receptive of being part of the leadership team. and. Um, I always really push that I need a business owner for every initiative, that IT should not love an initiative any more than a business owner, because usually it fails them. Is there, an, is there no such thing as an IT project in your world? Or? Well, there is an infrastructure, yeah. so I, I do feel that, you know, I'm responsibility, I have the responsibility for infrastructure. I need to be able to look around corners and say, how might this technology apply to, to our business? But, it, but in terms of, application support of business processes, I really want that to come from a VP on the operations side of the house, mm -hmm. or a uh, chief medical officer, or a clinician, and, and not IT. We should, but being part of the senior leadership team then, you can introduce ideas as well as any other senior leader. And I think the tough part for CIOs, and I would say even sometimes, I have a level of discomfort, is starting to comment on non-IT issues from a business strategy perspective. But you have to do that to be part of the team. And, and sorry, who do you report to? I, I report to, uh, it's a executive VP that reports to the uh, CEO, and he basically has uh, all the, all the, uh, the CXs reporting to him. Okay, yeah. so, so there's a layer beneath the CEO yeah. that yeah, exactly. is, is, okay, the, the but, buffer, but on a the week, heat shield to the no, CEO. No, no, I mean on a weekly <laughs> basis, you know, I'm, I'm part of what we call the operations head and it's it's the CEO and all the leadership. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, right. CEO's involved, I'm, Yeah, I'm sure. exactly. Uh, okay, and, and you mentioned the, you know, power plant, and it just, you know, I have to ask, because we're talking about Nick Carr's Does IT Matter? You wrote another book called The Big Switch. What about the cloud in your world? Will, will privacy and security concerns keep it out of your world or is that just a sort of an illusion that? I, I think uh, it's, it's a bit of an illusion in terms of, I think people were concerned about privacy and security. Uh, I mentioned HIPAA, there is something called business associate agreements that a cloud provider takes on the responsibility and for many years, um, some of the cloud providers said, no, we won't sign a business associate agreement. We don't want that liability. Well, we signed, on that risk, we yeah. signed a business associate agreement with uh, Amazon. For I was going to ask about that, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we're so. starting to move some of our, our research computing in that up into, up into the cloud. I mean, we see Amazon being very aggressive in terms of, of, of making itself compliant in exactly. healthcare, in government, the CIA cloud, et cetera. And, it, we see no reason why, at their growth rate, at their innovation rate, they can't provide that level of security and, and privacy. Do you agree with that? I, I agree with it, and they, they can do it better than I can. You know, in that it's similar to uh, you know, security is something else I, I worry about. You know, having to manage, you know, uh, system security provider makes sense to me because I can't look at five billion logs, you know, <laughs> that are generated every two weeks. Well, I think it's fair for organizations to say, well. Amazon security is a one size fits all and I can't fit into that size. Okay, that makes sense to me. Yeah. But to say, oh, they're not secure, which a lot of the competitors will say, oh, it's, it's dangerous. No, no, that's not the case. It's maybe not as flexible yet. Right. Over time, Amazon's going to just keep building in and others, but really Amazon today, building capabilities that are going to satisfy a bigger and bigger space. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, did you feel like, because you, you, you live in this world, right. you hear it from your colleagues, oh, Cloud is a bad word, we're never going to the cloud, it's never going to happen. Well, 
But you're, you're admitting that, that uh, a, a company like Amazon or a Google ultimately is going to have better security than, than you could ever architect Absolutely. because they've got the engineering resources and the PhDs running around. That's what they do. Correct. They're trying to take that away from you. What percent of the, the organizations do you feel um, are of that ilk? Do you think it's of, of, of the vast majority? Or, because a lot of companies will say, no way, I can do it better. Particularly, for instance, in financial services. Do you think, again, mm -hmm. is that an illusion? Because you're, you're, you're willing to break eggs here, so this is good to have. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you know, who's not? <laughs> I'd say, I'd say uh, you know, it's probably 30 to 35% that think like I do. Okay. And I think the other 65% are still proceeding very cautiously. But I don't know if it's more about security or it's more about turf. Hanging on. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, now, I mean, and there are some risks in the, in the cloud, I mean, in terms of obviously connectivity and, that and what happens if there's a disruption to that connectivity or a you know, distributed denial of service attack that shuts down your bandwidth you know, mm -hmm. out to the internet. So, mm -hmm. so there's risk, but there's, there's risk everywhere. Yeah, well there's also the impact, I think this whether it's symbolic or pol politically, if something bad happens and you've gone to the cloud, then the backlash is, see? We tell right. you, whereas if it happens to internally, whether it's Fidelity or TJ Maxx or, you know. But you know it's well, real. But increasingly, I would, I, increasingly, that's not becoming the case. I mean, it happens internally. You're, you're still getting a lot of, I mean, the, oh, yeah, the yeah, CEO yeah. of Target is gone, you know, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a factor, I think, but I don't think it's yeah. as big a factor as it maybe was a couple of years ago. Agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I just think, uh, yeah, you're seeing more things uh, that are subscription based. I mean, if we're all going to, well, not, I don't know that we'll all be. Uh, a lot of people will be on Office 365, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so or my, Google Docs or, or whatever. Google it is, Docs. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's moving that that direction. Yeah, you know, and it's the it's the business model you're even seeing with, uh, you, you know, in the uh, the SAPs, the Oracles. So all, uh, all Oracle talks right. about is cloud. Uh, SAP, we had them on earlier. We, we're all about the cloud. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> because they realize uh, you can really take a lot of cost out of your organization moving things to the cloud and not having to support that infrastructure. Okay, so as a CIO who's essentially come on theCUBE and said, look, the days of the CIO as we know it may be numbered. I'm really soft peddling what you said, because I don't want to put words in your mouth, but okay. that's essentially what, you, what you're saying, is that the role is changing, and it's it going to transform. Fact, it's going to transform, and it may in fact disappear in, in, a, in a lot of cases and organizations and be streamlined into to COO, CTO, and CDO. Right. So what advice would you give to your CIO colleagues who aren't necessarily going to be retired in 10 years? Where, where, where should they be focused? I think, I think you embrace it and start planning for that transformation. Because um, I, I really think that will be, uh, the new role of a, the, the CIO. Maybe it'll retain the title, but regardless, I think it'll be as I've described in more of a, a COO role. Functionally, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, Jim, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you. All right. All right, keep it right there. Jeff Kelly and I and Paul Gillen will be back right after this word. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT in Cambridge, Mass. We'll be right back.